So our next session is uh, about how Congress should think about the military of the future. Uh, it's going to be moderated uh, by Heather Herbert, who is a director in the political reform program at New America. She's a contributor to New York Magazine. She has senior positions at the uh, State, State Department of White House uh, during Bill, Bill Clinton's presidency. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over now to Heather. Thank you, Peter. Um, thank you all so much for sticking around for the part of our day where we, we dispense with the panels and we go one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be up here with Representative Moulton, who, um, as many of you may know, holds multiple degrees from Harvard, served multiple tours in Iraq, is a multiply decorated Marine, has served three tours in the United States Congress, and you may have heard from last week, he has another little project he's gotten started. Uh, so um, first, I'm going to ask that we put up our poll question. Um, we have one or two more poll questions today. And um, for those of you who have been here all day, you know the drill. You text uh, to the number on your screen, and you can pick A, B, or C. Uh, and Congressman, just as fair warning, we are going to come back and talk about this question as the, the audience ponders it. But, um, but while everyone is voting on this question, um, I'm going to ask you the question that I've been asked repeatedly as I was getting ready for this conversation. Um, so you're not the only service member running for president. Um, we've also got two members of the Senate Armed Services Committee running for president, one individual who put in decades on Senate Foreign Relations. Yet you say you're going to build a presidential campaign around national security, the issues that all of us live and die on. So, How's that going to work? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here, Heather. It's great to be here and an honor to have a discussion with all of you. I'm looking forward to the, the questions and answers. Um, so don't be afraid to ask me tough questions. I will get very tough questions uh, as the weeks go on here. Um, to answer your question, despite the fact that we have 20 candidates out there now, um, I think I was number 19, uh, I'm the only one who is actually talking about national security and really taking on President Trump on national security issues. And I think this is critical, not just because of where we are in the world, not just because I believe he's a reckless commander in chief, but frankly, because I think it's where he is weakest. And I don't think Donald Trump is gonna be so easy to beat as many Democrats like to believe. So I think we have to confront him on these issues, on what it means to make the country safe and strong, on what a, nat a national security vision is for Democrats, and fundamentally, what it means to be an American patriot. For a long time, Republicans have kind of taken ownership over these issues and Democrats have been unwilling to challenge them. And yet we have truly the most reckless commander in chief in American history in the presidency right now. And we have to show how we would lead on these issues. My background is also different. Um, uh, I am the only uh, candidate who has led troops in combat, uh, has had the challenge of bringing an extraordinarily diverse group of Americans, uh, people from all over the country with different religious beliefs, different political beliefs, in getting them united behind a common mission in extraordinarily difficult circumstances, in the middle of a war that probably about half of us disagreed with. And I think that that kind of leadership is exactly what we need from the next president in this incredibly divisive time in American history. So um, this is a fascinating result. This is not necessarily what I would have predicted. Um, so the audience isn't giving us a clear hint here, so I'm going to ask you two questions. Number one, what should the U.S. defense budget in 2030 look like compared to the defense budget now, um, just after the end of President Moulton's second term? Um, and then, more concretely, you've, you've said that um, spending 16 times more money on aircraft carriers than cyber defense makes more sense. Makes no sense. No sense, <laughs> no sense just to be clear. It's been a long day, it's been a long day. <laughs> so tell me specifically what should happen to the defense budget and what should we be spending more on and what should we be spending less on? Specifically, what do we spend less on? Well, I would like to see the defense budget go down because we're making much smarter investments. Uh, that means a lot less waste, fraud, and abuse, like everyone, every politician likes to say. But much more importantly, it means investing in the next generation technologies rather than the legacy systems that consume so much of the budget today. So what do I mean by that? Well, I think that, ironically, China and Russia actually have a bit of a leg up over us. Uh, an inherent advantage in that their defense budgets are constrained because they are not trying to compete with us in today's world. In other words, they're not going to try to build 13 or 14 aircraft carriers to match 
our air, number of aircraft carriers. They're just going to build the missiles to defeat them. 1,238 is a number I like to use. That is the best estimate we have for the number of anti-carrier missiles that China can purchase for the cost of one U.S. aircraft carrier. Now, I'm not saying that we need to get rid of all aircraft carriers, but we at least need to have a serious debate about their efficacy in the modern world. The reality is that a lot of these next generation technologies, investing in autonomous uh, airplanes, in un autonomous underwater uh, vehicles, investing in artificial intelligence, these are investments that we have to make just to maintain our economic competitiveness with the rest of the world, but they also tend to be cheaper weapon systems. So you mentioned the high tech um, systems in particular, and we had a very interesting panel earlier today on what the shape of cyber defense should should look like. What is what is a democratic platform on cyber security look like? What what's the current administration doing right, and what's it doing wrong? Well, first of all, the current administration is investing in all the wrong things, and their priorities are completely backwards. Uh, President Trump has designated more money for the southern border wall, which is somewhere around a fifth century BC technology, uh, at least as he has envisioned it. He's, been, he's invested more or designated more, allocated more money for that wall than for all cyber security across the United States Department of Defense. It makes no sense at all. We are getting attacked every single day through the internet by Russia and China. We are not getting attacked by our great adversaries through the southern border. Now, there are all sorts of other reasons why the southern border wall is a political ploy, not a smart investment, not helpful to immigration, uh, the immigration crisis, et cetera, et cetera. But if you just think about it in terms of protecting our national security and where this administration is putting its priorities, I think it shows you just how backwards uh, the investments really are. So there are a lot of investments that we need to make in protecting uh, American businesses, American uh, military installations from cyber attacks. And the fact that these continue to happen on a daily basis um, is more than enough evidence that we're, that we're neither investing in this proper security nor, I think, responding appropriately to the threat. I'm going to try to tempt you to wade a little more deeply into the bureaucracy Please on do. this yeah. question. Yeah. But how would you reorganize the way we're doing cyber in the government right now, and if so, how? I think we, uh, we, we probably should. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that we, I have all the answers because I think we frankly failed as a Congress to investigate this seriously enough. We have not really held serious hearings on how we might want to uh, reorganize things. Um, but while I disagree with the President in his advocacy for a space force, uh, for example, I do think there is an argument, a much better argument, um, for a separate cyber force. So let me just go into that for a second. It, the Air Force has a mission that essentially now includes space. Uh, a lot of Air Force hardware goes into space and comes back down in theory. Um, and so I'm not quite sure where you kind of draw the dividing line between um, the Space Force and the Air Force. And I think that, that probably it's a mission just better handled by one entity. Uh, the Air Force already handles it today. It's clearly the Air Force's opinion on all this as well. But cyber, on the other hand, uh, cyber is distinct enough, I think, from the missions, uh, the existing missions of the other services, that it would probably make sense to have it a bit more centralized so that we can respond more clearly to attacks and so that we have a much clearer chain of command. I used to work, before I uh, got to Congress, I used to work at a high-speed uh, rail project in Texas. And my office uh, was on the 42nd floor of a, of a building in downtown Dallas. And I could look straight out at the top floor of the AT&T World Headquarters. Now, I had an AT&T cell phone at the time, and I used to drop about two or three calls a day. Um, I noted uh, that AT&T didn't have any cell towers on the top of its building, which made me wonder about the science they say about uh, how t cell towers are totally safe. But in any event, because I was dropping calls, but in any event, you know, there were times when I was so frustrated with AT&T that I wished I had some of that paraphernalia that I had in my infantry platoon to take out their executive floor. But think about it seriously. If, if a Chinese squad came and had the same frustrations as me and decided to attack the AT&T uh, World Headquarters with a few rockets, we know exactly how we would respond. 
But if the Chinese attack the AT&T World Headquarters through the internet and properly perhaps do even more significant damage or take more information, I don't think we know as a country how we would even respond to that in terms of who's in charge. I mean, is that an NSA responsibility? Is it a DOD responsibility? Is it a, uh, is it a you know, CIA, is it an FBI responsibility? Does it engender a military response or is it something under the Department of Homeland Security? We haven't even figured this out as a country. And by the way, the responsibility for that is, is with us in Congress, specifically folks on the Armed Services Committee. But I think that illustrates just how far we have to go in developing not just our cyber capabilities, but our whole, our whole cyber structure, our whole stra cyber strategy and theory of the case. And I think this is perhaps an argument for why uh, it would make sense, as General Petraeus has uh, proposed, uh, an old mentor of mine, um, to investigating having a separate cyber force. Well, that logically leads us to think a little bit about the relationship between the public and private sectors when it comes to, to cyber, I mean, whether or not we are, whatever, we're thinking about the AT&T building. But um, the, the, your example does highlight the ways that um, defenses increasingly were, were sort of entangled, public and private sectors, in the high-tech spaces. Yes. How, um, in your current role and in the role you aspire to, what do you, what do you have to say about the way the private sector needs to contribute to national defense? Well, um, you're not supposed to sit and take tough questions and make them tougher, but I think I should here. Um, really, you know, really the elephant in the room here is, is what do we do about like, these Googles and Google employees who have refused to work with DOD? And there are other companies as well. And I think that is a very difficult question that, by the way, we should be discussing in the midst of this presidential campaign because this comes fundamentally back to our competitiveness as a country, to our national security, and to how we think about our moral leadership in the world. These Google employees, just to single them out for a second, have taken what they believe is a very firm moral stand. They said, we do not want to contribute to the Department of Defense. We don't agree with everything that the Department of Defense is doing. But I think this is very dangerous for our country because obviously tech employees in China are not taking that view. Now, they don't have the option, I get that, but the fact of the matter is that China has very successfully married its tech, its high tech, its economic uh, piece with its military piece, and uh, they give, that, gives us a, that gives them a significant advantage. So how do you get Google employees and the DOD to work together? Well, I think it fundamentally comes back to a vision for national service, where you inspire Americans to understand that their work on behalf of our country, on behalf of our defense, on behalf of our national security, is an opportunity for them to contribute, not just at a technical level, but at a moral level as well. I didn't join the Marines because I thought it was a perfect organization, and I certainly did not go back to Iraq three times after my first deployment for the invasion because I thought it was a perfect war. I went back because I thought I could make it a little bit better. Yes, because I didn't want anyone going in my place, but because I felt that my presence on the ground in Iraq would have more influence on how the war was fought than sitting back here and complaining about it. And I think we need to inspire these young people at places like Google and Microsoft and Apple and other countries, companies, to have that same sense of commitment to our country. Not believing that it's perfect. Not believing that DOD is doing all the right things. But by being part of the team, they can make us better and stronger and fundamentally more moral in pursuing our missions around the globe. Well. Speaking of um, thinking of ourselves as more moral and presuming our missions around the globe, um, you've also talked a bit about the future of NATO and how, how we think about the future of NATO and how we talk about it. And you've been maybe, um, maybe a little more willing to push the crockery around than some, and you said that there's a need to rethink NATO's strategic role and purpose and maybe re-examine our troop commitments in Germany and Japan. So what is NATO's strategic role and purpose? 
Well, NATO, of course, um, has been extraordinarily successful at um, not only maintaining military security in Western uh, Europe, but really economic security as well. And it's been a, a core alliance, probably the core alliance for the United States of America uh, for the last 70 years. Many people in the national security space, myself included, have been quite dismayed by President Trump's approach to NATO, disparaging it, disparaging our allies, threatening to pull out, um, really undermining the shared commitment that we all have as member nations. And if you'd asked me about this a year and a half ago, as I was in a, in a, in a speech I gave on national security uh, about that time, I would have said that the first priority of the next president has to be simply putting everything back together the way it was, to restore the same commitments that we had uh, before President Trump came to office. Now I'm afraid that things have gotten too bad. They've gone too far. But we have to take this opportunity to actually strengthen the foundations that NATO was built upon and fundamentally make them more relevant to today. The fact of the matter is that the 1949 framework for NATO is outdated, not in the ways the president says in terms of folks not meeting their commitments because we already had a plan uh, fashioned under the Obama administration to restore those commitments, but because NATO simply didn't anticipate the fact that here in 2019, Russia would be attacking our Eastern European allies, not by running tanks through the Fulda Gap, but through the internet, by undermining their democratic institutions, by sending the quote unquote little green men into uh, these countries to undermine local politicians, by attacking these countries um, through a technique called hybrid warfare that was never envisioned in 1949. And the problem for NATO is that we don't know how to respond to that. Does, do those types of attacks trigger the mutual security guarantee or do they not? I think the, the fear that many of us have is that, that Putin and his allies are sitting in Russia saying, look, we're attacking these guys every day and they're not doing anything. They're not doing anything to respond. So clearly, this mutual security guarantee on, in, uh, under NATO is by the by. It's not relevant anymore. And worse, maybe it's not even serious. So I think the opportunity and also the obligation that we have is to restore NATO, but to also do so in a way that makes it relevant for today. So we're coming to the audience soon, so you can start to think about your questions. What does that imply that the US presence in Japan and Germany looks like in 2030? Well, I think Again, two, two terms of the successful Moulton administration. I, I think that it probably can be reduced because the presence there um, was really anticipating some sort of um, you know, ground warfare type attack. Uh, what we need to do is have folks that are in, in Europe not conducting tank drills uh, like this great uh, unit that I visited in Poland. And by the way, the Polish were thrilled to have the Americans there conducting tank drills. Uh, when the Americans arrived with their tanks, they were lining the roads with American flags, saying, we've been waiting 60 years for you to show up. And, uh, and, th and they were really absolutely thrilled. But the fact of the matter is that when you talk to the, the tank company commander, he said, you know, we're conducting tank drills while Russia's just attacking us through the internet. We're not, we're not responding uh, effectively at all. And so, so what I would rather see is a, a, an American or an allied Western troop presence in Europe, that's more adapted to the threat. And so that what probably that, means fewer people. What does that imply for the Asian theater if you are both um, getting rid of character, carriers as the anachronistic platform they are and shrinking troop presence in Japan? How do you, how do you, how, what's, your, what's your strategy for China? Well, I don't in 30 think we seconds should, or less. I don't think we should get rid of carriers entirely. That's not what I'm saying. But I do think there's a real question as to their operability in the South China Sea. I mean, I think actually where aircraft carriers could be much more useful vis-a-vis -vis China is where China is expanding on the, the periphery. You know, the fact that China now has a presence, not technically a military presence, but for all intents, intents and purposes a military presence in the Panama Canal. Think about that. Think about their military presence all over Africa. Uh, this is where China is actually expanding. The idea that we are going to go to war in the South China Sea with China with a massive invasion force, I think it's just actually totally unrealistic. And so the fact that our military is so focused on preparing for that eventuality, 
rather than thinking about where China is dramatically expanding its influence and frankly has less strength um, on the outskirts of its empire, uh, I think is a misallocation of resources. So I've also talked about a Pacific NATO. I get the fact that the terminology doesn't quite line up, but this is the way folks understand it. And, and a Pacific NATO would work to bring together some often contentious allies, um, but allies nonetheless, who can help us contain a rising China and North Korea. I think we should pursue that framework for the exact same reason that we pursued it in Western Europe. And when people say to me, you know, well, Seth, how do you get South Korea and Japan to sit down in the, at the same table and be in the same alliance? Um, you could very well have said that about France and West Germany as well. Uh, but we did it. It was successful. And I think we should pursue a similar model in the Pacific. Audience questions. I know. Uh, OK, so let's start with the gentleman right up here. Um, wait for the mic to come to you, please. Hi. You said you're running on national security. Um, why can't I just assume that another larger name candidate, even if their focus is on economic or immigration policy, won't, once they're nominated as the uh, Democratic uh, nominee, um, just bring on a whole load of really great national security staff um, and say, and bring on a great Secretary of State, bring on a great Secretary of Defense, and they've got it there. Why do we need a national security candidate, not just a good candidate all around who has good people on national security end? Well, I think that's a fair question, and, and to, be, to be clear, I'm not just running on national security. I've been very outspoken about health care this week as well, as one of the few candidates who's not just subscribed to, uh, to Medicare for All, for example, um, as the blanket proposal that we force everybody into. So don't think that I'm not running a campaign that's more broad than national security. But the fact of the matter is that national security is an issue that should be at the forefront of the debate. And you have every right to vote for a candidate not knowing what his or her health care policy would be and just say, oh, we're going to bring on you know, important people to figure out health care, or not know what their economic policy would be. You know what? I don't really care if we have a socialist system or a capitalist system. I'm just going to vote for this person, and they'll figure it out. Sure, that's fine. I don't think that's a responsible way to choose a commander in chief. There's two parts of this job. One is president of the United States. The other is commander in chief. And I think we have the most reckless commander in chief in American history. So one, we have to be able to conf we have to be willing to confront him on that if we're going to beat him. But two, we ought to know what the next commander in chief uh, will have for national security policy. We had another question right here. Yeah. Little uh, clarity. So sorry, I'm and I'm sorry. Do tell us who you Brad are. Gail Fisher. Hey, Gail. Clarity. So uh, on the one hand, you're seeking sort of a reduction in force levels, perhaps, a reduction in big equipment, um, and it would save defense dollars. That, that, I think that's what I heard you say. Um, and for example, and shift to like cyber capabilities to counter adversaries. But then on the other hand, I hear, and perhaps I misunderstood, that we would need capabilities elsewhere for example, to counter our adversaries. So maybe the carriers aren't useful in the South China Sea because we're not going to have a big major conflict there, but we may have to deploy them elsewhere. So I'm just, can you just clarify a little bit, what is it exactly that you globally, how do you see this? This is my question. Uh, the, the fundamental answer is, is that it's both, that I think that we're both fighting today's battlefields on yesterday, sorry, today's battles on yesterday's battlefields in a sense, and we need to rethink our approach. But it also means that we just really need to adapt to the way the world is today, and I don't think we've really successfully done that. And my hope would be that we could do it in, in an efficient enough way that you can reduce the bu defense budget overall, and I don't think that that's an unreasonable goal if you just look at the high level, um, the, some of the, the, the big ticket items that we're talking about here in the high level approach. But fundamentally, Fundamentally, I think it's time to take a totally new generation approach, next generation approach, to one, our arms, two, our arms control, and three, our alliances. I've talked a bit about our arms, um, and that was embedded in your question. I've talked a bit about our alliances and how we need to rethink them for a, a new world. We, we also have an opportunity to rethink arms control. And done right, arms control doesn't just make the world safer by reducing weapons on all sides, which it does. It also gives us a strategic advantage. And it puts us in the driver's seat uh, for determining things like how, what rules of the road will we have for autonomous weapon systems? 
Uh, what rules of the road will we have uh, for cyber? You know, the recent Paris call about six months ago uh, gave France the opportunity to really lead on, on rules of the road for cyber. That should be us. We should be setting those, setting those rules. Uh, I advocated, especially a, a couple years ago, um, for a worldwide convention on the use of drones. And I, and I pushed that, especially a couple years ago, for two reasons. One, because I think it would make the world a safer place if we didn't rely as much on drones for everybody. But two, because at the time, we had such a strategic advantage in drone technology that I think that was the point at which it would be really advantageous for us to say, stop. Everybody draw the line where we are while we're still ahead of the rest of the world um, and, and put that and, and make that agreement and put that agreement in place. So I hope that answers your question, Gail. Thank you. So um, being as the president just has supposedly suggested that we would have a new generation of Russia-China arms control, if you could tell him what should be in those agreements, what would you suggest? Well, I would say that we should, it would be highly advantageous for us if we could reduce um, our ICBMs just as we're about to go into recapitalizing them, because that could save us a lot of money right here and now. So that's a place where we would get not just, I think, a, um, you know, a, a, a good agreement for the, uh, um, for the future of mankind, but also uh, a, an agreement that would be highly strategically advantageous, advantageous to us, not just militarily, but economically. But the second thing is that I think we have got to start having this conversation about arms control uh, with regards to these other areas. And if I were to pick one amongst all the ones that we've discussed, it's artificial intelligence. I mean, the fact that uh, fleets of autonomous weapons conducting warfare against another is no longer um, a matter of science fiction, but merely a matter of development timelines and military budgets, I think should concern everybody in the world, frankly. I think we had a question, yes, all the way in the back here. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this fascinating discussion. Uh, Cynthia Schneider from Georgetown University. I have a question about a conflict that's kind of a combination of new and old, and that is in West Africa, specifically Mali. Uh, they have, by the way, a novel approach to countering cyber threats. They just have such bad internet that nobody can use it, good or bad. I don't know how practical that is. But uh, I've been going there since 2015, and I've watched the security situation get worse and worse. And what's happening there doesn't involve Russia, but it involves outside a kind of toxic mix of different terrorist groups arming people who have had age-old disputes, specifically the herders and farmers, and arming them with machine guns so that now, whereas if you were angry that someone was using your land, you, previously you might hit them, you might hit them with a stick, you might yell at them, now they shoot them. And this, it's getting worse and worse. I wonder, what is your approach to the whole West Africa region, and Mali in particular? Thank you. It, it's a great question. And um, your, your comment uh, about their cybersecurity reminds me of, uh, of our security system for our nuclear <laughs> command and control system, which is basically that they rely on eight-inch floppy disks. And so it's very hard to hack the system, uh, which is uh, ironically uh, not only true, but, um, but an interesting challenge as we recapitalize it. Um, your question is important, and I think it actually plays into a much broader question about how we fight terrorism around the globe. Uh, I am a veteran of the war on terror. I did four tours in the Iraq war, starting in 2003. This now is the longest war in American history, specifically our presence in Afghanistan. And yet, there are four times as many Sunni extremists in the world today as there were on 9-11. If that doesn't represent a clear failure of our war on terror, I don't know what does. So we've talked mostly about great power competition, about how we meet the rising threats of Russia and China, which must be a focus of the next president. It should be a focus of this president and has to be a priority in the Department of Defense. But we also need to fundamentally rethink our war on terror across the globe. And I have some ideas on that. I'm not going to try to give a whole um, you know, dissertation on it. But frankly, it's another place where we need to hold the hearings in Congress. We need to have this transparent debate before the American people. 
because a lot of the things that we have done as a country, and frankly that many other of our allies have copied in the days since 9-11, have not only been ineffective, I think they've been frank, they've frankly completely counterproductive. We can sneak in one more question super fast uh, in the back. Yes, Commander Boyko from the French War College. So if I understand your strategy, China is uh, now contesting uh, international world order. They deny uh, freedom of navigation in Taiwan uh, Strait, for example. They are building their third aircraft carriers. They're doing huge naval um, shore forces in order to get rid of any other foreign influence. And so your answer is to get rid of your aircraft carriers a military presence in the China Sea. How can you deter China for taking control of Taiwan this way? So you're oversimplifying a bit, which is a, which is, is a very complicated, uh, complicated problem. Uh, again, I'm not advocating for blanketly just saying, okay, we don't need aircraft carriers. Um, I am questioning their strategic role uh, in, a, in, a, in a close in fight in the South China Sea. Uh, in, a, in a, frankly, in a wartime scenario that we're preparing for that I don't think is likely to, to really happen. Uh, there are a lot of other strategic ways that we defend, uh, that we defend Taiwan other uh, than aircraft carriers. Um, our undersea presence, for example, is something that's very important in that uh, defense plan. And without going into anything classified, um, you know, I think there are smart ways that we are prepared uh, and ready to defend Taiwan, and we will continue uh, that commitment. One of the ways that we strengthen commitments like that is by building alliances uh, in, in, in that part of the world, uh, which is a huge part of my vision for our, our security strategy for the Pacific. Fundamentally, what I think we need to do is be more realistic about what actual wartime scenarios there would look like. Think about where we can pressure China effectively. Uh, develop more range in our weapon systems so that we can attack China without them hitting us, which does not mean having an aircraft carrier close in uh, in the South China Sea. But it does mean investing in drone technologies and autonomous uh, vehicles and things like that. So the point is, more broadly, that I don't think that we're ready to go to war today in a way that's as effective as we could be uh, to meet the, the threat of a rising China. And so it's important not to sort of simplify that into you know, a simple trade-off between aircraft carriers or not. Uh, it's much broader than that. But the point, is more broad, more, the point is more generally that we need to really update our thinking, to, have, to bring a new generation of thinking uh, to these potential clients, to, to the conflicts um, that involve next generation arms, next generation arms control, and a new set of alliances. And with that, a half an hour has flown by. Uh, so please join me in thanking Congressman Knowlton. Thank and we head this way. Thank you very much.